week, as, uh, as soon as the video is ready, we'll bring it to you. But uh, uh, let's start uh, our discussion session, uh, which is designed to generate more dialogues, uh, hopefully with you, and dig deep and wide into power relations. Our first expert, Dr. Mark Valery, is the author of much appraised, much praised, Oman Politics and Society in the Kabu State. He is an associate professor in political economy of the Middle East at the University of Exeter, as well as director of its Center for Gulf Studies. The most elusive of Gulf states, Oman is an excellent place to start a discussion on politics in the Gulf. So let me uh, start at the very beginning, Dr. Uh, Valerie. If you could just give us a brief summary of the foundation of modern Oman. I, I, a lot of people here really don't know how elusive this state is. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair, and thank you very much uh, the, to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, I would like to, I mean, on, uh, Oman has been um, uh, probably the, I mean, it's traditionally viewed as the best friend of the UK in the Arabian Peninsula, and that's a long tradition of British involvement in Oman. Until now, uh, that's one of the countries where the British are the, are the most involved within the security uh, services and within the intelligence. Um, and Qabus is uh, the sultan, the current sultan is probably the closest, uh, I mean, he's Anglophile much more than Americanophile. Uh, and uh, the, the relationship with the UK is one of the closest until now between UK, the UK and, and uh, the Gulf countries with probably Bahrain. Um, the Oman uh, got the independence in 1970, uh, and since then, Qabus has been ruling the country. Uh, he has, that's one of the most personalized and most centralized uh, monarchies in the region because the, the Sultan holds the title, there is no prime minister, he holds the title of prime minister and there is no, uh, I mean all uh, main cabinet positions including foreign affairs, defense uh, and uh, for finance are in fact all held by ministers in charge of it but he's officially the, the one who is uh, controlling this cabinet position, <coughs> in addition to being the head of the armed forces, the head of the central bank. So that's an extremely centralized monarchy, which is probably, I mean, as uh, uh, Professor Michael Herb from uh, uh, Georgia State University in the US explained, Oman is not ruled by a ruling family, it's ruled by a, a, um, one person, Sultan Qaboos, and there are plenty of challenges ahead about the succession at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, is that where the British Sorry. You said that he's been there since 1970s. Uh, it's the British who put him, am I correct? Definitely. Uh, and uh, ever since there, this is, is this the beginning of the nation state of Oman, you think? Um, I mean, just on your question, yeah. Uh, he came to power uh, during the Dofar War, um, which was uh, a very important uh, war in the region at the time, um, because that happened at the time when Britain was officially withdrawing from east of Suez in 1967. Uh, but they were extremely active on the ground uh, to support uh, the father of uh, Sultan Qaboos uh, in his fight against uh, the, the Dofar revolutionaries um, at the time. And uh, at the, there was, by the beginning of 1970, uh, the year 1970, basically the situation was com becoming out of control in the southern province of Oman in Dofar. The, the British and the Sultan's armed forces controlled only a few pockets around the, the main town, Salala. So what the British decided is basically to make a coup and to overthrow the father and to put his, his son uh, on the throne. And 
basically, Qabus came to power, he was 29 at the time. Uh, he had absolutely no experience of uh, rule of anything. He had been under house arrest uh, by his father for four years after he came back from the UK for, uh, after his study. And uh, so he was put in place and he was considered by many experts in the world as really the puppet for the British. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, the, uh, he also, with the time, with the time passing, um, he managed to, uh, to ma marginalize all the other members of the ruling family to establish a cult of personality around this, uh, his power, uh, centralizing all, uh, all uh, child, I mean, positions around, I mean, in himself, creating this cult of personality and uh, establishing um, a, re a national rhetoric around the fact that he w he's at the center of the, of the renaissance of, the, of Oman after 1970, uh, and, and making a, a link between the emergence of the oil rent, which, is, uh, which appeared only at, the, at this time, at the end of the 60s, early 70s in Oman, his uh, uh, access to power, and the creation of a new Omani nation. So all these elements about oil rent, his person, and the, the, the Omani nation was the base, were, have been the basis of his, um, uh, of his uh, strategy of legitimization within the country. And it has worked for probably 20 years until the end of the 90s and early 2000s when uh, economic difficulties are starting to be quite tough. At the moment in Oman you have uh, uh, amazing figures about unemployment in the country uh, among the youth population. The uh, International Labour Organization talked about 48% of unemployment among the 15, 24, uh, the youth from 15 to 24. Um, the economic situation is very tough. And all this uh, official narrative is becoming more and more challenged by, by Omanis on the ground. And that's what really interesting because in 2011, during the, uh, the Arab Spring and the protest taking place in Oman, nobody expected that. And the regime, had, what is really interesting is that the regime is considered one of the most competent in terms of security and intelligence with the Jordanian support, the British support, the Egyptian support, and they could not anticipate at all the protest taking place, uh, which is also shows how we as experts, but also as policy makers, we tend to overestimate a lot the security services and the intelligence in these countries while there are plenty of deficiencies and issues. But in the time of the protest in 2011, um, the young people in the street were in fact challenging the, the, the official narratives and, the, and the, the, the regime's policies and even the Sultan for the first time in the name of the future of Oman. So they were disconnecting, and that's very important, they were disconnecting the Oman nation from the ruler and making, explaining that Oman will survive after Sultan Qaboos, so they wanted to know what was the Oman post Qaboos. And that was a very, very important, critical uh, disconnection between um, uh, and, uh, and uh, shift from the official narrative and making the link between Qaboos and Oman. They were explaining, uh, the youth on the ground were explaining, we want to know what Oman will be in the future, and we want to uh, challenge your policies and what you have been making uh, in terms of decision making in the name of Oman, and that's very, very important. What you've, <laughs> what you've just said uh, raises uh, many questions, actually. I, I don't know where to start, but let me start with, uh, uh, from your description, raises a question about the viability of the concept of nation state. Uh, in this case, at least, uh, is, are there Western imposed structures in that region, or at least in the case of Oman? And that's, um, I think that's a difficult question in the sense that... Uh, There's always been a community of Oman, community of Kuwait, community, but a nation state because you did say that people recognize where our man is, the future of our man is one thing, and this narrative is something completely different. I think um, it's not totally different. I think um, mm -hmm. 
what is important is that we saw in 2011 mm -hmm. in protests in all these countries, in Kuwait, in Bahrain, in Oman, that people were in the street, not in the name of their sect or their community, but they were in the street in the name of the country, in the name of their nation. The Bahrainis in the street had Bahraini flag. They had no religious flag. They had no community flag. They had Bahraini flags. The same in Oman. They were, well, they were talking in the name of Oman as a, as a nation, as a country. And Kuwait, it's the same. People were talking about Kuwaiti issues and what was happening in Kuwait. So I don't say that there is no transnational connection, but what I mean is that the nation state um, has acquired uh, uh, something, I mean, which is solid, and we can, we can call them as something artificial or anything, but in the end, the um, Kuwaitis are, are, I mean, they are feeling and they are thinking as Kuwaitis for the future of Kuwait. Bahrain is the same. They are not thinking in terms of Shia or Sunni primarily. They are thinking in terms of Bahrain, of the future of Bahrain. And that's the same in Oman for, the, uh, for what I know. Um, so what is important is that in order to contradict this idea, you have the, uh, what Madawi Rashid, professor at the LSE, has called the hyper-nationalism rhetoric from the leaders trying to emphasize a particular type of military aggressive nationalism uh, that is uh, portrayed by the rulers uh, in order to solidify the unity behind themselves. But this narrative goes against the, the, the narrative by the, pop the population and the, the nationals saying we, we are not happy necessarily with this hyper-nationalism that you are portraying. We want uh, to design our own nation and our own social contract for the future. And I think what is really important is that we see particularly in Kuwait, but it's true elsewhere. For a long time, we have, we've had the idea that the old rent was decided uh, this, um, by the rulers, uh, or the use of the old rent was decided, was in the hand of the rulers and decided by the rule and distributed to, by, to the population and spent according to discretionary decisions by the rulers. What is really important since 2011 and, and Kuwait but in uh, Oman also, that people have been saying the oil rent is not anymore something that the ruler controls and they distribute as they want. This is, some, this is a national wealth. And this is something that we want to have a say on in terms of spending, in terms of use. And that's really, really something critical, saying that the oil rent uh, is a, a national good, a national um, wealth that as a nation, we should decide what to, we want to do with it. And we, are, we don't agree anymore that the ruler has to decide by himself what he wants to do with it and redistribute it to calm down the population. Sorry, <laughs> this is me. Uh, uh, <laughs> you, you, again, here there's two points you raised. One, about, and both about legitimacy, what is the accountability? Who owns the wealth of the nation? Who decides what happens to us? How to proceed from here? How to progress from here? But there's another point you've raised, and I can't let go, is this image uh, that uh, massive propaganda machinery raised about um, uh, Oman, and, uh, if you don't mind me uh, uh, mentioning Oman, uh, of a stable, dependable country. And therefore, it's, uh, there is legitimacy. Stability itself is a reason for legitimacy. Look at other places, because one of the poorest excuses about democracy, it is a poor excuse. Democracy is a headache, they fight with each other. But look at, uh, and unfortunately, even in, in uh, other uh, Arabic-speaking states, and I give you the example of Egypt, where I come from, uh, the revolutionaries were praising Oman for stability. Which, so, so can you touch on these two strands, the account, you know, legitimacy, part of it accountability and part of it uh, stability, political stability? Um, 
I mean, Oman has been very good as a PR uh, strategy to present itself as an oasis of stability and all, and all these kind of things. Uh, they have been extremely successful at that. Successful because also there is a huge, there are huge PR companies that are working uh, in that direction, uh, supporting that. And there are, of course, countries like the UK, which has always been saying that Oman is a reliable partner, is a stable partner, and so on. Uh, the thing is that um, we, and that has been used very well by the regimes by saying, uh, and I think uh, Yahya mentioned that in the introduction uh, session, explaining that the regimes have been using the fact that uh, there is chaos <coughs> around, uh, there, is, there, are, there is chaos in Yemen, there is chaos in Iraq, there is chaos in other countries, in Libya. So uh, as a citizen or as a national of a GCC country, um, I should be quiet. I should, even if I'm not fully happy with the situation, I should stay quiet. Because if I start protesting, if I start complaining, I will transform my country into Iraq, into Yemen, or so. And the same situation also, I mean, in feeding into it also is the rhetoric according to which that uh, reforms are implemented at their own pace. Uh, reforms are slow, but they are taking place, and we need to leave this let this country go at their own pace. This is, if we think about that, it's an extremely culturalist and racist uh, position. This is exactly the same rhetoric that has been used, that were used in cables by the British or by the French under colonization to explain that Algeria doesn't need democracy. Uh, that was during the, the French occupation of Algeria and the French colonization of Algeria. The Algerians can't uh, govern themselves. They are too backward. They are not organized, they are too tribal, or they are too conservative, I don't know what. And that's exactly the same rhetoric that is used again by the regime themselves to say, look, I'm liberal, I would like to make some reforms, but in fact, my society too is too tribal, my society is too conservative. So better having me to control the situation for you for the interest of the West. And the West are buying into it. I mean, the, the UK, the French are always telling that, our Western link. Well, I, we should talk to Sisi. I mean, Sisi has been making Egypt a stable country. Uh, yes. and, and when you start uh, talking about Oman as an Egyptian, I can talk about Egypt <laughs> as a, somebody interested in Oman, because they say the same about Oman. They say, look, Oman is a stable country, and we should talk to uh, Sultan Krabos. We should support what he's doing. The, the, the truth is that the last, the last uh, Majlis Shura elections took place last month. Uh, the, the, the participation rate in Oman for the Majlis Ashura elections was the lowest in the history of Oman since the, the, the implementation of the universal suffrage in 2003. That was the lowest participation. Uh, people are completely disillusioned about the Majlis Ashura and about the, I mean, the participation in this. And uh, one of the most important, uh, there have been uh, harassment and bullying in, uh, of a number of prominent candidates uh, and uh, one of them uh, is very famous. She has been very important on the social media. She, she was harassed and there were a lot of electoral fraud to make sure that she was not elected in the parliament. So uh, we, we, I think we should go beyond this idea about stability versus chaos uh, or being beyond this dichotomy between uh, authoritar authoritarian rulers who are friends of the West against uh, I mean, Islamist uh, forces ruling this country and creating anarchy. This is a dichotomy that is fitting into the narratives of the regime. And what we saw in 2011 is that all this culturalist approach is completely wrong about the Middle East. You have, you were plenty of, pro I mean, the protests were led not by party, not by sex, not by community, but they were led by citizens and nationals who wanted dignity, freedom of expression, uh, fight against corruption, fight against inequalities as everywhere in the world. And the, the Middle East has been a model for protest in Chile, in Hong Kong, in Spain with the Indinados movements and so on. So we need to move beyond this idea about caring about stability or against chaos, I think. If we need to move from this idea, uh, this is, brings the question of uh, intersection between Western governments role in, in one uh, part of it and 
we, the intelligentsia in the West, uh, and the media indeed, where, of course, uh, Western gov as every government, have uh, their viable interests. They should protect their interests. But how do you assess their role beyond going uh, through uh, protecting their interests to something, from what you're saying, sounds more ominous, really, because all these images, all these propaganda was pushed and in, in many ways the question of stability and re reliability of these people fighting the bad guys who would hurt us in the West. Um, I don't think you made it up. Simon didn't make it up. Most of us didn't make it up. It's, it's a Western government and authoritarian uh, joint venture. So could, could we start about talking about the Western governments and how, how could it change? Because really they're storing bigger trouble for themselves. I think probably Simon as a professor okay. of international relations would be better than uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to him. Yeah. Oh, do you want to jump in? I mean, the, 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 just one word, I, I mean, the thing is, uh, um, I'm not a policy maker, uh, but I, I really want to say that um, um, the Middle East ha has been experiencing structural changes uh, at the moment in terms of demography, for instance. I mean, in terms of demography, we have to understand that, for instance, the uh, fertility rate in the region in all countries, and especially in the Gulf countries, has been dropped, has dropped dramatically within 20 to 30 years. So we went from, um, uh, uh, in Iran and in Saudi Arabia in the 1990, from a rate of uh, six children per woman, basically, to less than two at the moment, within 30 years. In uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran in particular, but we can see that the same in Qatar, in the UAE, in all the countries. I think Oman is at 2.5. Uh, children per uh, per women at the moment. So these are these are massive cha demographic changes. Um, we are we have societies where uh, more than 50 percent of the population at the moment is under 25, and usually more than 50 percent are under 20. So uh, the the generations of people who are between 10 and 20 now in the Gulf. Uh, in the Gulf Northeast are either not yet uh, still at school or are either not, I mean, they, they are about to enter the job market. So the main challenges that, in terms of economic challenges that these countries will face, these regions will face, are coming. They are not there yet uh, in terms of integration people on labor market and so on. And with, with these young generations who are, as I said, uh, usually uh, maybe the, the only son or daughter of the family or maybe there are only two uh, kids. So they have a totally different perception of what the family is, of what the, the traditions is, uh, are and so on. So their views of the world are completely different. And in that sense, um, we are only, I think, at the beginning of fundamental changes. The Arab uprising is just a first step, but that, uh, it will last for decades and, um, and I will pass to Simon. Thank you very, very much. Actually, it's a good place to, to, to turn uh, to uh, Dr. Simon Mabon, a senior lecturer in international relations at Lancaster University and director of the Richardson, Richardson Institute. His focus is international political theory, which he applies to the Middle East region. Uh, his book, Saudi Arabia and Iran, Power and Rivalry in the Middle East, which was first published in 2015, has been republished many times over. It fills a very important gap in, uh, in the field. And I understand he is the research fellow with one of our hosts, the Foreign Policy Center, uh, I, 
I'd like to start actually with a question of identities, which I, I wanted to talk to you about as well. Um, like those of Gulf nation states, uh, sectarianism, as somebody said earlier today, rightfully said, are a malleable, malleable uh, ca category. Uh, can we can we start by talking about this? Uh, and, but it is a favorite uh, description of the Middle East, especially of the Gulf. How do you see it as to a tool or, or a preferred tool uh, for authoritarian regimes in the Gulf? Thank you. I think. That's a really interesting and important question. I'll just uh, very quickly first thank uh, Drury, Adam, uh, Jawad, everyone at Salam for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be representing the Richardson Institute and continuing our collaboration, which for us is incredibly important given all the work you do. So thank you so much for, for all of your hard work. I, I think this is a really important question and um, it speaks to a project that I'm, I'm working on at present, a uh, Carnegie Corporation funded project called CEPAD. And what we're trying to do in CEPAD is to reflect on the ways in which sectarianism has been constructed, instrumentally used, and deployed by, by authoritarian states, by regimes, by prominent actors across the Middle East, and how that has, has operated as a mechanism of, of control, essentially, ever since the, the formation of the contemporary state in the Middle East, dating back to the the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the, the end of the League of Nations, or sorry, the, the League of Nations, the Treaty of Versailles. And if, if we go back to that period of time, we can see that, that sectarian identities have been positioned within the, um, the biopolitical uh, governance structures of the state, if you will, to, to borrow some, some terms from Michel Foucault, Giorgio Agamben. Um, and if I may, I'll just quote uh, Gertrude Bell, a prominent, British, um, I, I don't really know how to describe her given her various different hats that she wore. Um, official, perhaps, is maybe the best and most ambiguous way of referring to her in the Middle East. And she was involved in the, the creation of the, the Iraqi state in the 1920s. And, and what she did was she was particularly concerned about the, the threat to stability posed by Shia groups across the South. And she, um, in, in her diary, she, she wrote about the perception that these Shia groups had strong links to Persia at the time. And she was worried that if the Shia groups were really um, located within the fabric of the state, then that would be a way in for Persia to erode the, the sovereign essence of the Iraqi state. So this isn't a new entity. This isn't a new idea that dates back to 2003. It dates back to the very establishment of the contemporary state in the Middle East. And, and if we look across the, the 20th century and into the 21st century, you'll see that identities have been deployed, mobilized, uh, manipulated at the whim of, of sovereign states, at the whim of rulers and the powerful. And I guess that the resonance of this demonstrates the power of, of religious identities, the stickiness of these religious identities, that they have the capacity to, to mobilize, they have the capacity to speak to, uh, to broad concerns. They're not just purely instrumental, they actually resonate across society, but they have been deployed and mobilized and manipulated by the powerful in an attempt to, to ensure the survival of these particular regimes. And this isn't a new thing. This isn't a new phenomenon dating back to 2011 in the Arab uprisings. But it dates back all the way to the 1920s. And you can see this in the, in the archival but, documents. But here, but here you've just raised some, the, the, the question of uh, sovereignty. How sovereign it is, any of these states, if the narrative around them mm. has been constructed by uh, Western officials, as you call it, or operat operatives, or what, however you want to call them. And, and, and yeah, 
It's a difficult question. Um, I've just finished a book that explores this idea of sovereignty, and it's, it's a fundamental question in political theory. How do you understand the roots of sovereignty? And if we look at the Weberian model, um, you can see that there are common features of a sovereign state, the idea that you have a bureaucracy that can collect taxes, you will have institutional mechanisms, the, the ruling elite will have a legitimate monopoly on the use of force. So there's, there's these features that would be identified as being the prominent features of a sovereign state, and that's embedded within international politics, the United Nations, etc., etc. But if we look at the actual source of sovereign power and legitimacy, the, the point about legitimacy I think were really important, we'll see that there are different sources of legitimacy across the Middle East, across the Gulf. Um, I and mean, if you look at the Saudi constitution, you'll see that God is the source of all of its laws. I mean, Saudi doesn't have a, a formal constitution, it has a basic law. But God is the source of that. God is sovereign, right? But the king is also sovereign because the king can suspend the basic law in times of crisis. So there's a, there's a tension there. But I think if we look at the fundamental features of, of what is typically accepted to be a sovereign state, you can see that there are these institutional dimensions, the barbarian model applies broadly speaking across the Middle East. But when we go deeper into what what that barbarian model is is um, filled with, then we get these real sort of differences, religious, cultural, political, tribal differences that that offer a rich tapestry for understanding sovereign power contingent on time and space. But uh since you mentioned some of... Did you want to say something? Of course. For you, for you. It was just a reminder. God. <laughs> Terrible, huh? Um, uh, since you mentioned the literature uh, on, on identities, this is uh, a book by uh, Amin Malouf. Uh, it's usually... Uh, uh, he's a, a Christian, Lebanese, and French cis citizen that my Gulf students at Georgetown uh, find especially to their liking. So, what, what, although, and, and, and he argues that nobody has one identity, it's, it's, there must be very narrow uh, human being who has one identity. And therefore, would you, s can you imagine uh, a situation where when the umbilical, uh, this new colonialist umbilical cord uh, is severed, that the region would find new identities, just as it's finding, looking for new ways to legitimize. Yeah, of course, and I think what's going on in Lebanon and Iraq right now is a, a really good example of this, that in these two states there's been this, this long-standing framing of events along sectarian lines. And I sort of hinted at it earlier on, but this was a, a manipulation of political life. But what people are trying to do in Lebanon and Iraq is say, halas, we want something different. We don't want to be constrained by these, these long-standing identities around which the fabric of the state, the organizational structures of the state have been built. Um, and you look at the political dimensions of the power sharing, uh, power sharing dimensions, you look at the economic issues, you look at the, the basic governance structures of states, uh, Lebanese state and the Iraqi state, and you'll see that the protesters are wanting something different. These protesters are explicitly articulating um, membership of, of anti-sectarian groups, they're explicitly articulating a desectarianization of, of political life, they're articulating being Lebanese and being proud of being Lebanese, being Iraqi, being proud of Iraqi, being anti-Iranian in some cases because they're trying to move away from that very narrow understanding of identity. Now, the question is what comes next after that? And that's where new identities will be forged, um, interest-based identities, um, maybe political identities, class identities. All of these will come to the fore and they will play out within the context of this reimagining of political life. And I imagine that, that this will also take place in other states across the region when the conditions are right for it. I mean, I'm thinking of Bahrain in 2011 and there was an opportunity for the reimagining of, of political life. And I remember the, 
the chants from the streets, and not Sunni, not Shia, just Bahraini. And it was that, that rejection, again, of sectarian narratives in favor of something more collective. And of course, there would have been different identities that come out after that, but there was this moment of collective empowerment that was ultimately destroyed by the, um, by the powerful who sought to, to decimate the, the collective moment and the collective movement by framing it in particular ways. And we all know the, the processes that happened there. But there was this, this moment of, of collective empowerment along particular lines that were rejecting the, the pigeonholing, this framing of events in very narrow sectarian ways. So, yeah, there is this reimagining going on, and it'll be interesting to see how that goes. You wrote a book about, uh, which I've mentioned earlier, about w w in which you looked very uh, carefully at Saudi and uh, Iranian political rivalries. Uh, and I, presumably there's uh, systems of governments as well. Do you find the main basis on which both Saudis and Iran system base their government essentially identical or do you see them di different? Because you, you did mention something about uh, Saudis uh, have no system, you know, the God is sovereign and all this, which from a Muslim point of view, I can tell you, we can argue a lot about that, uh, about a, a governor who says, it's, I, I, I rule in the name of God. I look forward to that. <laughs> yes, it's coming. Uh, and um, so can you, can you tell us about the differences uh, between the two systems of their basis of legitimacy and how how entrenched each one and how easy to dislodge both, uh, either one of them. I think that they're very different in the way that they operate, albeit perhaps aspiring to the same type of goal. They both aspire to, um, to claim leadership of the broader Islamic world. Um, and in that sense, there are similarities. But the way that that operates, I think, is dramatically different. The Saudi state is, is um, traditionally m less democratic than the Iranian state, which has at least the facade of, of democracy in certain areas, albeit um, certainly constrained by, by a range of different forces. So there are, there are different processes at play. The two aspire to claims to legitimacy in the same type of manner. They, they both aspire to this leadership of the, of the collective community of, of Muslims across the world. But what is interesting is that very quickly after the revolution, the Iranians sought to frame the, the post-revolutionary Iran as speaking to, to all Muslims and oppressed Muslims, drawing on the legacy of Karbala, drawing on the legacy of, of Shiism, but not explicitly framing this as speaking to Shia Muslims because of the, the broader demographics, they wanted to speak to all Muslims, and um, the, the legacy of Shia thought, of course, features prominently. But what the Saudis did is they tried to reduce the claims to legitimacy that the Iranians were making by framing the revolutionary events as both Shia and Persian. In doing so, drawing on demographic differences, and drawing on long-standing fears amongst many um, Arabs and indeed British, going back to Gertrude Bell, about the manipulation of, of political projects, about the loyalty of Shia communities, and about the, the legacy and historical legacy of, of Persians and Persian conquest. So it's the manipulation of events, and we see that playing out to this day. It's, it's still a mechanism through which ruling elites try to uh, try to play out. Thank you very much. I have lots of questions, but uh, we have to move uh, now to uh, Anwar. Uh, Ustad Anwar Rashid. Anwar Rashid or Al Rashid? Al Rashid. Lesh get bina Rashid. Ustad Anwar Rashid. came from Kuwait 
traveled from Kuwait, uh, where he is the chairman of the Gulf Forum for Civil Society. Uh, I'll say it in Arabic as well. Rais al Muntad al Khaliji li Munanzamat al Mujtama al Madani. He will give us a presentation after which we hope to have more time to find out from him about the background of his group and his assessment of the most recent, indeed very exciting developments going on in the Gulf, including Kuwait. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to speak Arabic because my lecture is very sensitive and uh, Mr. Jawad uh, will translate it. I would like to thank you very much for the I I لطرح رؤية للمعارضة الخليجية على المجتمع الدولي. I'm happy to be with you today, and I'm delighted to be in this event. And I was looking for long time to be part of such events uh, and to present uh, with other uh, GCC oppositions, NGOs, civil uh, societies. Uh, such visions toward what's going on in the Gulf and for the future aspiration. Uh, أنا أنور شيد في الكويت وكاتب صحفي من سبعة وسبعة وتسعين. قرب المكافون أنور. أنور قرب قرب. خريج جامعة القاهرة سنة واحد وثمانين بكالوريوس كنت مدير المكتب الفني في أمانة المعلومات ودعم اتخاذ القرارات مجلس الوزراء الكويتي ومستشار نائب رئيس الوزراء. ورئيس مدارك الاستشارات السياسية هذه الحقيقة لمحة بسيطة لأن البعض يعرفني والبعض ما يعرفني بداية Just uh, Anwar, uh, he presented a short profile of himself uh, with his photo when he was kid in 1966 and uh, I think uh, details of his profile you can find it in our websites uh, so I don't want to go through the details yes. أنا uh, قد نتفق كالعادة طروحاتنا وقد لا نتفق وأعتقد كنا وجدنا وهذا أمر طبيعي كنا نوجدنا أو حضرنا في هذا اللقاء أعتقد هذا بحد ذاته إنجاز كنت أطمح له من زمان. So to to agree or disagree this is very very natural but to be here uh, all together. As activists, or even politicians, or human rights defenders, and to look for the future of the Gulf, or uh, any vision toward aspiration of the uh, Gulf, this is a really remarkable event and remarkable uh, uh, moments that we can share all together. Uh, ونبحث عن إجابة لها دائما يعني نقول دائما من نحن يعني كمعارضة خليجية متعددة الأطراف والمشارب ولماذا ماذا نريد وكيف نحقق اللي نبي أو اللي نريده okay. ومتى و وأين there are a few essential questions we have to raise. Uh, who are we? Uh, what we want or what we demand? How we demand it? And uh, when uh, uh, we have to raise it or demand it? And where uh, we have to raise these demands uh, and so on? And, and definitely uh, uh, in what way?
من تقريبا اول عام 2019 عملنا دراستين مهمات جدا دراسه تتعلق بالحريات في دول مجلس التعاون الخليجي ودراسه لتحول الاسر الحاكمه الخليجيه الى ممالك دستوريه الدراسه عن الحريات في دول الخليج اللي عملناها والدراسه الاخرى اللي عن الممالك الدستوريه وصلنا الى نتيجه مهمه جدا. في مجال في دراسه الحريات خلني بس وي كاري اون تو امبورتنت ستاديز اند ذا فيرست وان واز اباوت ذا جنرال رايتس ان جي سي سي كونتريز اند ذا سكند وان اون ذا فيجنز تورد هافينج كونستيوشنال مونوركي ويذن ذا جي سي سي كونتريز الدراسه الحريات شارك فيها 1145 مشارك من دول الخليج مقسمين على هذا التقسيم ولا اريد ان ادخل في هذا التقسيم ممكن تشوفونه ولا الدراسه موجوده كامله ممكن الاطلاع عليها والبحث فيها هذه المشاركات كانت من كل دول الخليج حقيقه رجع محمد رجع السلايد Okay, so the first study was about the general rights in the Gulf, and we had a sample of 1,145 1, uh, citizens within the, all the GCC countries in this category, uh, number-wise and the country-wise, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, and UAE. And here is indicating that the percentage of the people within the sample who participated in this study. خلاصة دراسة الحريات أو دراسة البحث اللي عملناه عن الحريات في دول الخليج دراسة يعني نتيجة كارثية الحقيقة يعني يعني تخيلوا الآن تقريبا 80% لا يستطيعون إبقاء رأيهم في دول الخليج يعني 79 و88 من مواطني دول الخليج الذين شاركوا بهذه الدراسة يقولون بأننا لا نستطيع أن نتحدث دون أن يكون وراء حديثنا عواقب واريد ادلل بهذا الامر يعني حتى الكويت اللي كانت من الدول بعدين راح تكمل الكويت اللي كانت من دول تعتبر يعني من واحه وسط الصحراء قاحله في الخليج اليوم الكويت لديها احكام على اصحاب الراي قاربت السبع قرون وهذا مسجل لدينا بالاسماء والاحكام um. The main and major conclusion of uh, the studies over the general rights uh, in the Gulf, you can see it here, almost 80% of this sample, uh, they uh, confirm that there are no rights, and at the same time there are fear of type of the harassment or punishment or targeting them at all. So they cannot express their idea freely at all. And even uh, Kuwait, uh, uh, as example, uh, uh, where Kuwait had a little bit marginal freedom compared to the rest of the GCC, we can see Kuwait almost considered to be in the same level. As example, there are cases that uh, th some people express their views or just they made the tweet, and we can count like seven century as imprisonment for these uh, cases that indicate that there is no such uh, uh, room for uh, freedom or expressing your view within the GCC country. أما بحث دول التحول إلى ممالك خليجية هذا البحث أيضا مهم جدا اللي عملناه ورح أمر على أيضا مرور سريع شارك بها 778 مشارك مقسمين كالتالي الملاحظ في الدراستين أن أكثر المشاركين كانوا يكونون من دولة الكويت على اعتبار أن الكويت شوية فيها نوعا من الحرية نوعا ما يعني لذلك دائما تصير المشاركات من الكويت أكبر وأقل المشاركات أي طبعا أيضا من هذا وهذا أعطانا مؤشر مهم جدا عن مدى الحريات في أي دولة خليجية على حد the second major study, as I mentioned earlier, is about uh, possibility that the GCC government to be converted to the constitutional monarchy. 
our samples is uh, within the range of 770, uh, 778 uh, uh, citizens. And as per percentage wise and the number wise of each country, you can see the majority of the samples are coming from Kuwait. 51%, almost 403 out of them are from Kuwait. And this is itself is give you some indication that a little bit there are more uh, room for freedom of expression in Kuwait compared to the others where we could see that people are ready to participate in this uh, study and express their view a little bit freely um, or marginally compared to the rest of the GCC countries. Uh, the, these two studies are being supervised by Dr. Bashar Bagli, and uh, he was uh, from uh, what university? Uh, uh, St. Andrews uh, University. St. Andrews University in Scotland, yes. دول الخليج أو الأسر الحاكمة الخليجية ثمانين في المية يعني ثمانين في المية من المستفتين في دراسة تحول دول الخليج أو الممالك الدستورية إلى 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 ممالك دستورية يعني مؤيدين لذلك ثمانين في المية وشوية من مواطني مجلس التعاون الخليجي المستفتين um. The very remarkable conclusion of both these studies is this phrase that majority of 80.8% of, of GCC citizens, they are in favor of converting their countries toward constitutional monarchy similar to the uh, progressive constitutional monarchy in Europe. It is not just to convert it to constitutional monarchy, but to be as standard as the constitutional monarchy in Europe. And as we mentioned, and you can see percentage, very, very high percentage of those who participate in this study, 80%, they are in that favor and they are, they are demanding that. <laughs> النتيجة وما ود أن أوصل له من خلال استعراض بسيط لهذه البحثين أن هناك خوف شديد يعني وعالي المستوى لدى مواطني مجلس التعاون الخليجي بالتعبير عن نفسهم وعن ما يجول بخاطرهم وأيضا هناك رغبة شديدة وعالية المستوى بأن يتحرروا so the percentage of almost 80% of those participating in those studies are really afraid to express their uh, ideas or to uh, have a free expressions. And uh, the conclusion is there are a, a very high level of fear and, and, and there is a very high level of tension to express uh, their uh, ideas or uh, their views and they have a very strong feeling toward that uh, the change should be there, uh, the change toward the constitutional monarchy. So on one hand there are so much fear and on the other hand so much strong, uh, uh, um, I can say, belief or uh, the, the, the demand to have uh, uh, changes uh, within their current condition. <laughs> والبحثين كانوا بإشراف أكاديمي لم يكن هالبحثين هما مجرد جمع راء وتحليلها وإنما كان أيضا وفق أسس علمية وقيم علمية. We cannot ignore facts of the statistics. We cannot ignore the numbers and percentages. And it's been carried on by neutral body and through the scientific scientific method so uh, this is will give us a clear vision of what's going on in the GCC within the majority of the citizens uh, 
So within these two studies, one hand, there is a fear and there is restrictions on the freedom of expression. And on the other hand, so much willing toward the change, toward constitutional monarchy, how we can uh, try to find our way, how we can try to make our movement toward these challenges and toward uh, the, this obstacle we are facing. يعني من الامور اللي اللي اللي, اللي وصلنا لها ان هناك في رقبه جامحه لدى مواطني مجلس التعاون كان يجب انهم يتخلصوا من هذا الواقع اللي هم فيه. آه وبذات الوقت خوف شديد من آه المستقبل، ما في يعني لم تطرح رؤيه او مشروع مستقبلي الى آه آه شعوب دول مجلس التعاون الخليجي. ودعوني بهذه العجاله يعني انا تابعت يعني دائما اتابع نشاط الاخوه الخليجيين وما اكثرهم لاجئين سياسيين هنا في لندن وفي كل اصقاع العالم حقيقه وتابعت ايضا المؤتمر الرائع جدا عملوه مجموعه المعارضه السعوديه اعتقد في فبراير الماضي يمكن وأسفت حقيقة وأنا أتابع المؤتمر لم يصدر عن المؤتمر حتى بيان يبين رأي هذه المجموعة واتصلت ببعض الزملاء يعني قلت لهم ما يصير ما مؤتمر ما يطلع ما يطلع في رؤية ولا تصور مش معقول أو ديسمبر يعني أوكي ديسمبر بعد سنة as I indicated earlier, there is strong uh, ambitious and the strong feeling to try to change the current conditions and we have to shift from uh, the current circumstances to something or uh, a different and, and environment that we are looking for. And at the same time, there are strong fear about what going to be in future. There is a vague because neither the governments and even maybe the NGOs up to now, they didn't give in a clear vision toward what's going to be in future. And this is part of our responsibility that we have to carry on and to have to clarify it and emphasize with it. Uh, recently, there was a conference being organized with some uh, NGOs here in London, but I couldn't see their uh, end statement of wrap up of that conference. I hope that such movement going to be in more uh, um, uh, organizational way that we can uh, read the outcome of such events or conferences. Uh, by the way, any Muslim Khaliji, any Muslim Khaliji, when they want to talk about the speech, they put this picture in front of us. Any GCC city to speak, he will look at this hanging uh, uh, rock. What's the goal? هناك واقع وهناك تطلعات هناك واقع خليجي وهناك رؤى وتطلعات كيف نسيق هذه التطلعات إذا أردنا أن تحسين واقعنا للمستقبل أفضل لابد من دراسة الواقع وإمكانياته. If we're going to be realistic and we want to change the current conditions and we have to know what's the condition we are living in and definitely to go to our ambitious or futures. First of all, we have to find out the steps we are moving in and the ground we are working on. And then we can be more realistic when we are planning for the brighter future. Any visions is not considering the current conditions or environment or uh, a different compartment of the current conditions, it will not lead to the sustainable or uh, uh, fruitful uh, future uh, as we need. <laughs> There are two main facts are there, and we have to consider it as a currently. There are ruling family, never ever they want to uh, give up their power at, by any means. In the same time, there are 
uh, international superpowers, which they have their own interests. In that region, definitely they will not give up their interests and still they want to be involved or uh, geopolitics of that region. What we should do? لا بد من البحث بشكل جدي لتطوير فكرة تحول أسر الحاكمة الخليجية إلى أسر مالكة نظرية رابح رابح أعتقد يجب علينا أن نفكر فيها. So with current conditions and two main factors which I mentioned and we have to find out and to be serious to find out how we can develop our ideas our visions toward uh, uh, shifting the current. Uh, GCC ruling families to a constitutional monarchy to get the uh, um, theory when and when. وهذه أرضية رائعة جدا ممكن ننطلق منها طالما أن لدينا ثمانين في المية من المواطنين مجتمع الخليجي يؤيدون هذه الفكرة. So if we believe that 80% of the GCC citizens are demanding that or in favor of changing the uh, governments or the regimes toward the constitutional monarchy, so we think that it is a very uh, potential ground or strong uh, ambitious there that we can shift toward this uh, demand constitutional monarchy. <laughs> رؤية فيجن طرح مستقبلي ما يعني صعب انك انت تكسب الراي العام بس لحظه شويه الاشكاليه المعارضه في كما اراها في في دول الخليج كمجتمع مش كفرديه لم تطرح مشروع يعني الجماعات الاسلاميه بتصنيفاتها لديها مشروع عودة الخلافة أما الجماعة المدنية ليس لديها مشروع لم تطرح مشروع يعني طرحت مشروع دولة مدنية لكن أين وكيف ومتى لم يطرح هذا الأمر. Um, definitely we have to uh, uh, present our vision toward the future. We have to uh, uh, promote our vision within the GCC governments and we uh, regardless of what background you are coming definitely we have to prepare ourselves for such visions in right way. And, and unfortunately, still the different opposition groups or different uh, even NGOs, yet they didn't collectively, didn't uh, um, uh, forwarded any um, feasible visions which could be a, a practical solution to the current uh, crisis. And, and, and different groups like uh, uh, Islamic groups or different groups, either they want the, the Khalafat states or Islamic states, which maybe is, won't be uh, accommodating uh, the, all the visions or different different uh, sects of the uh, community within the Gulf. So, uh, uh, and those who are believing in the civil states, still they are so behind to promote their vision, or even they didn't uh, uh, collectively agree on a common vision. هذه يعطينا صورة عن الممالك الموجودة الممالك الدستورية في العالم يعني في كندا أو في إنجلترا أو في دول سكندنافية وأستراليا بما فيها الشرق الأوسط يعني. This map is indicating that constitutional monarchy where is there in the world. ينقصنا المشروع بالفعل ينقصنا. The dark one. ينقصنا المشروع يعني لذلك لا بد من طرح. Uh, definitely, we need such a vision or we need such a proposal to go and adopt uh, the state based on the constitutional market, civil state based on the constitutional market. I think so we think with this proposal, constitutional monarchy, we can maintain the right uh, of all citizens and all nations within that region, at the same time, uh, uh, the rights of the ruling families. 
هل نحن في هذا المؤتمر نلتقي لكي نفضفض نفشة خل ونمشي؟ Or we are here just to express and to uh, express our feelings or our views and, and that's it, say goodbye? أنا أعتقد إذا كانت الإجابة بنعم وما في داعي نكمل هذا المؤتمر إذا ما طلعنا فيه بشيء. So if the answer is going to be yes and then it will not be that much fruitful or useful uh, for the outcome of this uh, conference. خلاص دكتور نروح نسمع الأخبار ونروح البيت. So maybe it's better to listen to the daily news and go home. إذا كانت الإجابة ب ب بلا فيتطلب منا So if the answer is no, then we have to start working and creating working group and to be considering it as a project and continuous, uh, 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 continuous plan for that project. علينا ان نطرح مشروع الممالك الدستوريه كخيار مستقبلي يبشر بمستقبل اكثر امنا للاسر الحاكمه الخليجيه وايضا الى شعوب المنطقه وايضا الى الامن والسلم العالمي ايضا. So we have first of all believe in a, a group work and at the same time we have to uh, consider or adopt constitution monarchy as a future vision or aspiration, and that uh, definitely will lead to the more security and stability of the region and uh, uh, all uh, those concerns about this uh, uh, strategic location uh, part of the world. We have to open the channel uh, through the dialogue within different sects of the society and try to uh, lead them to have uh, contacts and uh, uh, discussion among themselves about this proposal. أساساً والذي ثمانين في المية منه مهيئ لأن يتقبل فكرة الممالك الدستورية بسرعة. So we have to work on to organize ourselves as a group and then try to try to convince the 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 public opinion internationally in the same time in GCC first of all to consider such proposal as a practical project and. We can follow it up and try to implement it gradually. Then he show it. The the the. I mean, more than that, we can also talk with this group. This is to talk to the President of the United States and the European Union. In 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 this idea. I I propose that out of this conference, we can agree on a committee that they can start their work to try to promote these visions and try to work on it. Regionally and internationally. طبعا أنا أنا بحكم متابعتي أنا بقول لك إنه في في ألم خليجي يعني الشعوب الخليجية في ألم خليجي والألم هذا الخليجي متمثل في الكثير من السجون والأحكام واللاجئين السياسيين. Because I'm coming from that region, I can feel and and there are a fear within the 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 citizens there and all the communities. And because there are oppression and there are detentions, they are targeting the and there is banning of any type of human rights. يعني حتى أنا ما أعرف يعني إذا ردت لكويت شنو بصير فيني بعد ال الاستعراض هذا. Even I don't know what's going to be happening to me if I go back to Kuwait after this conference. أمامنا نظريتين حقيقة أما نظرية بانديلا أو يعني لتحقيق هذا الهدف أو نظرية خاسر خاسر ما أمامنا يعني خيار آخر ولا ولا نريد أن نخسر لا الأمن ولا الاستقرار ولا أي شيء. To achieve that ambitious toward the concession monarchy, we have just two theory. 
there is no third one, either to adopt the theory of Nelson Mandela, that means peaceful movement, or uh, uh, to adopt the lose-lose uh, uh, method, which is going to be differently lead to the destruction and no one will win. فأي من الطريقين نختار يعني أي من الطريقين نختار يعني هذا الأمر أتركه لكم وأترك هذا يعني لكم لتجدوا لها إجابة يعني أنا وكما استقبلتكم بالزهور ودعكم بالزهور وأنا آسف على الإطالة وكان يعني حبيت أن أتكلم بالعربي عشان أكون أكثر دقة بما أعبر عنه وشكرا Thank you very much, and uh, I leave the answer to you. And like I uh, started with uh, giving you the roses, I will end up giving you roses. And thank you very much. Any question? Any question? I think for everyone, yeah? yeah. Okay. Can we invite the speakers back up? Um, the good news is that lunch has arrived. Um, but 10 minutes ish, we're going to let you have uh, your thoughts and questions, clarifications. Are we doing the questions now? Yes, yeah. we're going to go straight to questions. Uh, okay, uh, uh, this is the fun part, but uh, to get as many uh, voices as possible, which is really the, the, the reason we're here, uh, please put whatever your comment, and comments are. are uh, welcomed as well, or question, one minute, one minute on a, only. Thank you very much. The lady there. Thank you, Mr. Rashid. Uh, very enlightening and very actual and realistic, what, whatever you put there. One comment only. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Nelson Mandela, uh, he had to go through stages during his you know, uh, movement. Uh, it wasn't a total win-win situation was a lose, lost, win situation, and then a win, lost situation, then the win, win situation. And we have to accept this. We cannot go, I mean, according to whatever we have, we have, we have to pass through these stages. We have to be realistic. We will lose at certain stage. Uh, governments will win certain stage we might win and the governments might lose and by the end oh, okay is that yeah. the point thank, thank you, you very very much you've been very kind yes sir well, my question is to mark uh, you talked about Oman uh, uh, there is this idea that the UAE is putting a lot of pressure on Oman and then Oman has uh, in fact you know, is going through difficult times there's even the talk of that the next Sultan of Oman could be changed subject to the UAE pressure uh, they want to have a person who would be able so are you really uh, are you following that because this is something very important and the Omani authorities keep talking about jobs and stuff like that in order so, so, so you're interested in succession, okay, because we, we, we were supposed to cover that. Next, we'll take three questions and, uh, 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 and, and go. Yes, yes sir. Um, so my question is to Mr. Rashid. Um, so I don't know if this is a more of a question or an assessment, but uh, one of my, the main frustrations I had with the presentation uh, is sort of the lack of any explanation as to the methodology that was employed to, you know, to get those statistics. And I think Fair enough. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, I didn't ask the question. Uh, 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 let's start with Mark, uh, us, uh, to, to get rid of the succession in Oman. Uh, Yes, 
طريقه طريقه <تصفيق> يقول لك ما في منهجيه في هذا ليتس ستارت ويز ذا سكسيشن دو يو ونت دو ذا سكسيشن اني بادي ونت دو ذا سكسيشن Yeah, I think that's a, a major question, and uh, the thing is, uh, it's not a recent one, because uh, many Omanis uh, on the in the street have been worried about what would be, I mean, that there is no plan for succession, at least what we know, at least. Uh, the thing is that the UAE um, uh, is, the, o the Oman-UAE relations have been quite difficult, and not to say more than that. Since the since the uh, the death of Sheikh Zayed, over, of course before also, but since the beginning of the 2000s for 15 years, there have been a lot of problems. Uh, the border, as you know, is almost uh, closed between the two countries, so it's extremely difficult to cross the border. Um, there are issues about the fact that, of course, Oman considers the UAE as a threat, uh, with the fact that o the UAE has a more and more presence in South Yemen. They are present in Sokotra. Uh, they have a view about Musandam, and uh, there are issues about uh, the, the role of the UAE in Musandam too. So the, for, the, for Oman, the, the, uh, the relation with the UAE, and for the UAE, the relation with Oman is extremely difficult. One of the main actors, I think, for the succession, we, don't, we should not forget it, is the UK. The UK has a role in that, and they want to have a role in it. Uh, after 2012, 11 and 12, Uh, when there were uh, these protests in the street and so on, and when protesters started to talk about the Sultan and to call the Sultan directly, mm -hmm. and not anymore talking about the cabinet members, they were talking to the Sultan in the street. Uh, the, the UK has been pushing the, 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 the Sultan to appoint a prime minister. They have been pushing very hard, strongly by saying to him, uh, you have to appoint somebody as a prime minister, he will uh, act as a safety valve or as a fuse for you, It will attract all attention and all protests and grievances from the population, and you will remain the kind of father of the nation, and you will make the transition smoothly, and you will remain in the history as the father of the nation. He has said no, clearly no, to Alan Duncan, who was the special envoy of the UK to Oman. And uh, so the UK has and wants to have an involvement in that, and, they, uh, and the That's an, another actor. The UAE definitely, Mohammed bin Zayed, wants to have a role in that. Um, but Mohammed bin Zayed, I think, uh, he's considering that whatever the next sultan will be, he will be so weak uh, in terms of legitimacy and in terms of economic situation that he will have to rely in one or another on Abu Dhabi's money and uh, on the UAE. So Mohammed bin Zayed probably doesn't want to appoint somebody or to Have, doesn't have necessarily have his own candidate at the moment, but the, the, he knows or he thinks that in any case, Oman will be weak and will be in the situation to have to uh, rely on uh, UAE man in the future. Yes. شكرا ممكن استاذ جاسم انت ترجم الكلام اللي بقوله لاهميته. أه بالنسبه ل أه 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 بالنسبه لسؤالك استاذه يعني هي قضيه الوين وين واللوز لوز يعني احنا نعتقد بان بعد النتيجه هذه اللي سويناها في البحث والدراسه أه ما امامنا الا ان وين وين لا نريد ان نخسر المواطن الخليجي في بحبوحه وطبعا مش كلهم اللي في بحبوحه لا معنا بتقدير لا يتجاوز 30% يعني في 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 من دول مش تعاون خليجي وبالتالي اعتقد الوين وين هي النظريه التي يجب ان نتبعها يعني ما امامنا خيار اخر، قضيه العنف ومحاوله التغيير بال بالعنف هذه اعتقد خاسره. اما بالنسبه للمنهجيه يعني 
Well, uh, you know, what Anwar is saying is that uh, uh, there is no substitute to the win-win formula. That's the only viable option that we have. Uh, certainly there is no point to go for violence. Violence can really destroy uh, the issue. Uh, and that uh, what we have to do is just sustain the work of peace and, and peaceful measures. Uh, and, and hopefully we can, we can achieve some success. اما بالنسبه للمنهجيه يعني ممكن تطلع على الدراستين موجوده هي في موقع تويتر في مدارك للاستشارات السياسيه والاستراتيجيه موجوده الدراستين ممكن تطلع عليهم وجدا مهم ايضا الكل يطلع على هاي الدراستين يعني ليس دعايه ل لمدارك الاستشارات وانما للاستفاده يعني احنا عملنا هالدراستين بتكاليف تحملنا تكاليفها على على مدى اكثر من اربع شهور للاعداد وهذه ونشرناها ليطلع عليها المجتمع المحلي وهي مثل ما قلت يعني باشراف الدكتور بشار البغلي يعني في جامعه سانت اندروز في اسكتلندا <تصفيق> No, you're talking about the methodology that you know there is a website to go for, and uh, you mentioned the, the website, this is the Madarik, uh, you know, for consultancy. It took about four months to, to gather the data and uh, uh, under supervision of a well known uh, academic at uh, really at, uh, at university. So it says there is, there is a space for that to go to go and check, and he encourages people to go and visit the website. I would have loved to hear everybody, and I hope we'll talk. But I was given instructions by the, the organizers uh, uh, that the final question is uh, for our their very, very own, uh, the wonderful Yahya Lassi. Thank you. And it's not questions, just very small comments about the Saudi dissidents conference. Uh, Anwar, he criticized that, and he said there is no outcome. Uh, for us, I believe. There's lots of work is going on. Uh, and also, he asks to do some work and to fight with the repression and to ask to tell the world what's our messages. I think there's massive work, and we can't blame people that are fighting the regimes because the regimes they are very very powerful and they have uh, allies they supporting them all around the world. So we need to be more realistic than optimistic. Uh, regarding to our uh, conference, we did the conference for several times. Yes, there is no clear outcome because the first time for people so, like Saudi people to come together, to talk together and to deal uh, with each other while the regime for decades he, uh, keep dividing people. At the moment, I feel it's real success. They gather together and the next success, hopefully we'll publish something soon. Thank you. Uh, alas, we must end here. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before we do, I must thank our experts for their uh, most stimulating presentations. And most of all, thank each and every one of you uh, who attended this session, and indeed the organizers who chose to stand up for reforms that allow the peoples across the Arabian Peninsula and the world to see their cre creativity and potential that can only require the oxygen of freedom. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be here in an hour. Uh, no, no, less than an hour. Hopefully just after two. Hopefully just after two. I hope there's some food, so go have it.